Mark Devil Jack from Revix Business Accountants here. I'm joined today by Ben Mitchell from Your Key Advocacy. Ben, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for having me. My name's Ben Mitchell, Your Key Advocacy. I'm a property buyer's advocate, and I love helping people navigate the property market in Melbourne. I have a background in property management, so I know what a good investment is versus a bad investment in terms of tenancy, but I really would love to learn some more about tax and property tax. So. Um, coming to that, Mark, what sort of records do I need to do I need to keep for my income tax when it comes to property? Well, Ben, if you're using a real estate agent, they'll keep the records of the rental coming in and also the expenses they pay for. What you really need to cap capture is the expenses you pay for, such as your mortgage interest, if you pay the land tax and the rates, those sorts of things. Um, larger expenses that the property agent wouldn't necessarily keep and you need to keep those records for four years after you've lost your tax return. And when it comes to negative gearing, um, how exactly does that save me on my tax bill? Well Ben, in some situations your rent will be less than the expenses you pay um, and that's pretty typical for a property that is relatively newly owned and that way you've got your income less your expenses brings a loss that you can actually claim on your tax return. So if you've got wage and salary um, earnings, then you'll get a refund from that PAYG that's connected with that. Um, and if I owned a property interstate, such as in Queensland, and I fly up there to go to a routine inspection, can I claim that on my tax? Oh, well, we used to be able to claim that on our tax, but unfortunately now we can't. The, the ATO have brought in special rules around travel and especially interstate travel to visit uh, these properties and now they consider that to be personal in nature and won't allow the deduction. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> no more no more holidays to Queensland. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and look I've actually just had some clients purchase a rental property and it needs a new kitchen so they're actually going to install a new flat pack kitchen in there it's going to cost them about fifteen thousand dollars. Can they claim that on their tax? Well, when you purchase a property, if you spend money before you rent it, it's called an initial repair. And so the property might, you might have paid more for that property if it had been, um, had it been in good use. Uh, another example of it is with the new tenancy laws around Australia, if the heater is not up to code, you have to replace that before it can be rented as well. So those costs are considered capital costs on purchasing the property. And generally you'd get some form of depreciation over the useful life of those things that they put in. So you don't get an immediate tax deduction, but you do get it over a period of time. Okay, all right. So Mark, how about if I had a tenant move into the property, I didn't do much work to it and had an older bathroom, the tenants then moved out of the property and during that vacancy period, I decided to update the bathroom. Would I be able to claim that update on tax? Well, it, it depends exactly on what you do, Ben. Um, if you're replacing like with like, so if there are, um, if there's vinyl on the floor or tiles on the floor and you replace them with exactly the same type of material, then you would get an instant deduction for it. Generally things like painting um, and the like, you'd get an instant deduction for. But if you, for example, pulled out the shower and the bath and the toilet, and replace them, you're clearly not replacing the same with the same mm -hmm. because you wouldn't be able to replace a 30 year old bathroom or toilet with a 30 year old toilet. So in those situations you would get depreciation over time on those deductions. But some of the money you spend will be immediately deductible. Okay. All right. In terms of selling my investment property, what records do I need to keep over the time of my ownership to ensure that I'm able to um, reduce any tax or capital gains tax? Yeah, capital gains tax is the tax you pay when you sell an asset. So it's at the end of the ownership period. So when you purchase your property, you should be keeping the contract that you bought the property on and also the lawyer's settlement statement that will tell you um, what you paid them in stamp duty and it will also give details of the purchase. Um, also, you might have had a building inspection prior to or had an architect through prior to. So you should keep the receipts for that because that forms part of your capital base. 
And if you paid a buyer's advocate, that's where you would get the deduction for that um, expense as well. Now, during the tenancy, if you do capital works on the property, generally your accountant would keep those records. Um, and there's also records to be kept at the end. So if you pay for advertising, obviously you've got a, usually an agent that sells the property. So any of those sort of legal costs and things at the end as well. So generally you get a deduction for anything you didn't get a deduction from during the ownership. That's really good to know because I'm often taking architects, builders and doing building inspections on all the purchases I make for my clients. So it's good to keep those records on file so that when you do sell the property in the future, you can then use that to reduce your tax. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, correct. Great. Right. And look, I bought a home some time ago and I've decided to move out and rent elsewhere and rent the property out. Um, what happens to the tax on my home? Well, th there's two sides there. You, you've um, left your primary residence. So in the past, you wouldn't have been able to get any tax deductions on that. Going forward, uh, because you're receiving rent now on that property, things like your future mortgage payments, uh, the cost of owning the home, such as rates and land tax, and any other costs that you have to maintain that property become deductible to you. And obviously the rent is, uh, is uh, accessible. So depending on where you are, whether you're gonna make a profit on that or a loss on that, that would need to be declared on your tax return. Now, the other thing to think about is when you were in the home as your own home, that was always a tax-free home. Yes. So there was no capital gains tax on that, that property. And going forward, it could be subject to capital gains tax. If you don't have another home, uh, private principal private residence, then you have up to six years to have your old home as that principal private residence. Um, as a rule, what I would generally do is get the home valued when you mm -hmm. leave it mm -hmm. because that can make a difference. If you then subsequently decide to sell that home in the future and you're within your six years, mm -hmm. as long as you've kept the right paperwork and you don't have a second home, then that should still continue to be a tax free. And we often see this when people might move overseas for a couple of years, mm -hmm. but they want to keep their property in Australia and they want it rented. So yeah, I think that that is a, a good tax concession if you can do it the right way. Okay, all right. So as a real estate agent coming through and doing a sales appraisal, is that sufficient enough documentation or would you need a bank value to come through? No, I think an appraisal. I mean, you need to be happy with the, the value. Yeah. Um, but I think that as long as it's in writing and as long as that appraisal's been given by someone who has some um, knowledge in the area. Yes. Okay. So you, would, you wouldn't get the housekeeper or something to do the valuation. You get yes. someone who has right. experience. Great. Okay. That's really, really fantastic information, Mark. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Ben, um, I'm thinking about going into property for another time and I've got a few questions yes, for you. Yes, be happy so, to answer them. <laughs> um, if I'm an investor and looking for capital growth, what's the type of properties that I should be looking for? Well, obviously there is the rule that land is king. So as long as you're buying something with land, and I, do, I generally really like to look at the location as well to make sure you're close to public transport and things like that, but it's your land size. That's always gonna be where you're getting the larger capital growth over your, your two year period, your four year period, your 10 year period. So that's definitely what I would be looking for. Land is king. Yeah. Um, if I'm looking for cash flow as opposed, so like say I'm a, a heading into retirement and yep. looking for cash flow rather than capital growth, where, where would I look there? Look, something that's always gonna have a high demographic of tenancy. So apartments are actually really, really good investments for cash flow return. They've generally got higher rental yields they might not get the capital growth that you would get from land. And as long as you're buying in the right block, an apartment or a townhouse um, with, with minimal facilities as well, so your outgoings aren't high, they're generally a safe bet for good ongoing cash flow, particularly as you move into a, a new stage of life. They're also lower maintenance as well. Thank you. Ben, what do I need to think about when I'm purchasing a property in relation to finding a good tenant and a good tenancy? Yes, all right. I always like to think as an owner-occupier. Is it something that you would live in or you'd have your kids live in too? The other thing is to look at the minimum standards, the compliance, make sure that it's up to scratch when it comes to the new compliance levels in Victoria. 
And also make sure that the property is really well maintained and easy to maintain because as soon as it starts um, looking a bit worn or you're having things break, you're gonna have tenancies. It's gonna start to become a revolving door of tenancies and that's what you don't want. You really want stable, long-term tenants who are gonna give you a good return. And sometimes it's also about keeping a good tenant as well. It might come up to their 12 month uh, renewal term and you might go, oh, well, I could probably get an extra 10 or $20 a week. But sometimes if you've got a good tenant, don't, don't rock the boat, perhaps leave it for that year and perhaps do an increase the following year, as long as you don't get too far behind. You don't wanna end up $600 a week behind what the market value is after 10 years. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, I've got friends that are intent on purchasing a property for uh, Airbnb. Yeah sort of things what do you need to take into consideration if that was their sure pay? i mean airbnbs do get you a very good return but you definitely need to have somebody managing the airbnb and they do take quite a hefty chunk of the profit so you'd expect anywhere from 18 to 20 percent plus the cleaning as well then you've also got to look at the location a lot of airbnbs are going to be in apartment buildings in the city or fitzroy or st kilda those high high traffic tourist areas and you wanna make sure that your building is okay with Airbnb as well. You don't really want to buy into a nice boutique building with lots of owner occupiers who are gonna get their back up when there's you know, six or seven different people coming through in a month to live in the property in their building. That'd probably be my main point. Yep, thank you. Um, auctions are really stressful and, and I personally try and avoid them because they, they are so stressful. Um, what's your advice um, as an advocate? Yeah, well, as an advocate, I actually love an auction. I love the transparency of an auction. There's nothing worse than seeing a property that you really, really love, and then you get a call from the agent saying, we've had an offer that's acceptable to the vendor. It's above the price range. We need your best and final offer by 5 p.m. There is nothing worse than that because you're going in blind. You could miss out on the property by, by $2,000, or you could overspend higher than the person behind you by $50,000. So it's like a Dutch auction. I don't really like that. An auction is transparent. So as long as you do all your research with your broker, with your buyer's advocate, make sure you, you know your numbers, what other properties are out there that buyers are gonna be looking at, and set yourself a limit. As long as you've got that limit and you walk away when you hit that limit, then that's fine. Everything happens for a reason. There'll be another property that comes up but it's a transparent way to purchase property because you know exactly where you stand. So your, your advice is to take someone with you to take the stress out of I it? I think take a professional to take the stress out of it. They'll do all the bidding for you. They'll sit down and do the numbers with you, work out what your limit is, or, or maybe even what your stretch limit is. Um, but as long as, as, as long as you walk away when you hit that limit, that's my advice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot about off-market purchases. Um, are they the way to go? Are the, how, how do we access those sorts of opportunities? Yeah, look, off-market properties um, can be a bit of a golden nugget, particularly when there are low stock levels of good properties. So at the moment, what I'm seeing is vendors perceive it to be a bad time to sell because of all the media noise you've got out there. So you've got low stock levels of good properties. Agents still need to make a living and they do that by selling properties. So they're on the phone, they're calling the prospective vendors and they're saying, look, I, I would sell if you got me the right price, but I really don't want to spend 10 or $15,000 on marketing. So if you can find me a buyer. So then as an advocate, I'm constantly fielding off-market opportunities in terms of properties that um, the vendors want to sell, but they don't necessarily want to go to market. Now, the thing to watch out for is you can't determine how many people are going through the inspections. You can't see the level of interest. So you need to be really, really confident when, do, when you're doing your numbers that you're not overspending. You can often pay for the privilege of purchasing an off-market property. Um, one thing that I certainly do with all of my clients who do purchase off-market is I put a bank valuation clause in there just as an extra level of protection. So then the bank will come through and they'll value it, hopefully appropriately at what you've purchased it at, but red flags will start flying if you have spent too much money on the off-market opportunity. Well, that's, that's really handy to know, thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for coming in today and spending the time with us to explain what, what you do and, uh, and those. I've definitely learned something today. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And I've certainly learned something about tax on property as well. So I'll be able to advise my clients 
um, and send them send them in the right direction yeah. as well. Well, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.